Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you succeed in your GCSE. This lesson, the Doppler effect. This video is suitable for GCSE students sitting the following exam specifications. This topic was suggested by Hassan Tariq, RDM, Ellie Pallet, Blossom Hibbert, Connor Graham, MTS Hassan and Sanjana Tasneem. Thanks guys. If you've got a topic which you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. In the last video, which you can see if you click here or check the description, I discussed how the redshifted light from distant galaxies and the extremely redshifted cosmic microwave background radiation all give us evidence for the expanding universe and, by extension, the Big Bang. But what is redshift? How does it happen and why does it happen? Redshift is just a specific example of the Doppler effect, named after Austrian physicist Christian Doppler, who suggested it in the 1840s. You get the Doppler effect when you have an object which is doing two very specific things. Firstly, it needs to either be producing waves itself or reflecting waves coming from another object, and secondly, it needs to be moving. Now, these waves can be any type of waves. They could be electromagnetic waves, such as visible light or microwaves. They could be sound waves, or they could be ripples in a pond. And that's exactly what I'm going to focus on to help us understand what's going on here. I'm going to use a ripple tank simulator to simulate what would happen with a duck on a pond and the ripples which it would be producing as it moved. If you want to have a go with this ripple tank simulator, I'll leave the link in the description. Here, our duck is swimming back and forth across the pond, and as it does so, it's producing ripples with a fixed frequency. Notice that these ripples are spreading out at a constant rate. They have fixed velocity, just the same as any particular frequency of waves in any given medium. So their velocity doesn't change, and their frequency doesn't change. But the duck is moving. So notice that as it produces each new ripple, it moves towards the wavefronts in front of it and away from the wavefronts behind it. Which means that the waves in front of it tend to bunch together and the waves behind it tend to spread out. This is the very root of the Doppler effect. This idea that the thing producing the waves as it moves forwards causes the waves in front of it to get closer together and the wavelength to get shorter and the waves behind it to get longer wavelengths. Next time you see a water bird on the surface of a pond or a canal, take a look at the water in front of it and you'll see exactly the same effect. Those waves bunching up in front of it as it moves and spreading out behind it. And so you get shorter wavelengths in front and longer wavelengths behind. This is the Doppler effect. That is really all that there really is to it. If you can picture this bird swimming across the surface of this water, then you can understand what's going on with the Doppler effect. Let's imagine we've got a sensor in the pond and that sensor is detecting the ripples. As the duck swims towards that sensor, that sensor bobs up and down more frequently. That is, it bobs up and down with a higher frequency as the duck is approaching it. And then, as the duck passes it, it's then going to bob up and down more slowly because the waves are further apart, they have a longer wavelength, and they act as though they have lower frequency. And so our sensor is going to bob up and down with a lower frequency after the duck has gone past it. So to summarise, as the duck paddles across the surface of this pond, it's bobbing up and down with a fixed frequency. A sensor in front of it would detect waves with a higher frequency than that because the waves get bunched closer together as it moves towards the sensor. Once it passes the sensor, that sensor would detect waves with a lower frequency than the original frequency which the duck was producing because those waves are getting stretched out behind it. So the waves are getting bunched closer together in front of it and you get a higher frequency and then the waves are getting stretched out behind it, and so you get a lower frequency for a fixed sensor observing that frequency. This is exactly what's going on with any object which causes the Doppler effect. The only thing which differs is how we perceive those different waves. So let's consider sound. I want you to picture this car driving along, beeping its horn. And as it drives towards you, beeping its horn, the sound waves are going to get bunched up. That means that we're going to perceive them being higher frequency, just the same as as the duck was going towards the sensor, it made the sensor bob up and down with higher frequency. Now when it comes to sound, 
frequency relates to pitch. So that higher frequency sound would sound higher pitched than it really is. The driver in the car would still hear the normal pitch of the horn because they're moving along with those sound waves. But to an outside observer stood on the pavement, as the car drives towards them beeping its horn, that horn will sound higher pitched. And as the car goes past, that horn will then start to sound lower pitched as those sound waves are stretched out and the apparent frequency to the outside observer is less. So as it drives towards, the sound is higher pitched and as it goes past and drives away, the sound is lower pitched. Now, the faster an object is moving, the more pronounced this effect is. So it's particularly obvious with things like Formula One cars or emergency vehicles or aeroplanes. It becomes much more obvious when you've got a very fast moving object. Again, the exact same thing happens with light. In the visible spectrum, the most bunched up close together waves are the waves at the blue end of the spectrum. And the most stretched out waves with the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency, they're at the red end of the spectrum. So, if an object is moving towards us, then the light waves from it will be more bunched up and they'll be closer to the blue end of the spectrum. That is, we say they're blue shifted. Alternatively, if it's moving away from us, then the light gets red shifted as the rays get stretched out. Now, as with our car and emergency vehicles and Formula One cars, the faster the object is moving, the better. So although this effect does actually occur as a person walks towards you, the light from that person will be slightly blue shifted, it's only going to be a very minor effect. It's not going to be noticeable. They'd have to be moving towards you very quickly. And I'm talking about a reasonable fraction of the speed of light before it really became noticeable and measurable. When we look out at all the distant galaxies in the night sky, we see that the light from them is almost all red shifted, with the most distant ones being the most red shifted. And the amount of red shift shows us that they are not just moving away at, say, the speed of a car, they're moving away at a decent fraction of the speed of light. They are moving very, very quickly away from us. Now, some of you may have remembered that the colour of a star relates to its surface temperature. Hotter stars look blue and colder stars look more red. And so you may be thinking, well, maybe that's why these galaxies look like they're giving out redder light, because there's more red giants in that galaxy. Well, actually, we can figure out exactly how much the light from a galaxy is red shifted. And that all comes down to what that galaxy is made of. It's primarily made of stars, or at least that's what we can mainly see of that galaxy. Stars are primarily made of hydrogen. And hydrogen has an interesting property. When you get hydrogen heated up to the sorts of temperatures which you have in a star, it emits light at these specific frequencies. This is what we call the emission spectrum of hydrogen. Every different element has its own emission spectrum and we can recreate these in the lab fairly easily. Each one of these you can think of being as the fingerprint for that particular element. And so hydrogens here, if we see this particular pattern in an emission spectrum, we know that it's got to be hydrogen. This is how we can figure out that the sun is mainly hydrogen, because it particularly strongly emits light at these very specific frequencies. This is how we can look at other stars in our own galaxy and figure out that they are similar to the sun. Even if you've got something like a red giant, or you've got something like a very hot blue star, it's still going to particularly strongly emit light at these frequencies. Now, when we look at distant galaxies, those galaxies are also made of stars. And those stars are all emitting light at these frequencies. And so if this pattern has been shifted to higher frequencies or lower frequencies, then we can see that the light has been shifted. And then we can figure out how much it's been shifted and therefore what the relative velocity of those galaxies are, and that's led us to our whole idea of the Big Bang. Hopefully you've got a pretty good idea of what's going on with the Doppler effect now. To bring things back down to Earth, I just want to go through a few more day-to-day -day applications of it. Firstly, uh, police speed guns and speed cameras 
often rely on the Doppler effect. Usually nowadays they're using infrared lasers which are shining out from that camera or from that speed gun and they're being reflected usually by the number plate of the car and bouncing back and they're detected and as that infrared radiation is detected by the detector the amount that it's being Doppler shifted will tell the police or will tell that automatic camera how quickly that target vehicle is moving. We can also use it to target much bigger vehicles, aeroplanes. Normally in this case we'll use microwave radiation and this is what radar systems use. They fire out microwave radiation and they'll spin round, firing it in different directions. When it's reflected back that tells us the direction of the aeroplane. The time it takes for that reflection to go out and come back tells us how far away the aeroplane is and the Doppler shift of that radiation, either being bunched up if it's moving towards us or stretched out if it's moving away from us, that Doppler shift tells us how quickly that aeroplane is moving. We can also use this in a very day-to-day -day way uh, any time that we're trying to make a weather forecast. Raindrops will also reflect radar, so long as you get just the right frequency. And so any time you see a weather forecast where they've mapped how rainfall has spread across the country, what they've done to detect that rainfall is used a radar system as well. And the raindrops, as they've fallen, have given a Doppler shift to that radar signal, and it's been sent back to the detector, and they're able to detect how quickly the raindrops are falling, how many of the raindrops there are, and so on. And that's what you see on the nightly weather forecast. I hope that video really helped you. To see what else I can help you with, there's lots more videos to check out on my channel. Scroll down the main page there to see I've already sorted them into playlists to help you find the video you need. You can also check out my revision guides which cover everything you need to know for the exam. They feature links to my videos, revision tips, cover both foundation and higher tier, and unlike a lot of revision guides, they also point out what you don't need to waste time. If you want to check your learning, try the Snap Quiz website and app, which allow you to identify which areas you need to spend the most time learning. Remember, this is the only YouTube channel which brings you the teachers, the textbooks, and the tests all on your terms, on mobile phone, tablet, or computer, for you to revise when you want and how you want, even immediately before you go into the exam. All of these links and any others for this video will be down in the description. Lastly, it really does help my channel if you want to leave your likes, if you subscribe, or if you know someone else who's having trouble, tell them to search for Mr. Thornton. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.